Dear God, just thank you for the day. Thank you for the friends that we have here. Thank you for the weather. Thank you most of all for you, dear God, and for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon me and my family for generations. And uh, I mean that literally because none of our families ever had any bad diseases or anything, and it's all because of you. And we pray, dear God, for our country. And we pray for your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> I'm George Wilson, and I'm 85 years old, and I've, I've been blessed beyond belief, and I've mentioned God more than one time, uh, but we, I grew up in Clemens, uh, I was born in 1938, grew up in Clemens, and Clemens was a very small town, and my, my mother's side of the family was from Clemens, and my dad was from Davidson County, and I'll say a little bit about my dad's side of the family. I don't know much about them. Uh, I never, I haven't done a family history report or anything, but my granddad was Eli Wilson, and his wife was Bessie Weaver Wilson, and she was raised down around Yadkin College in the western end of Davidson County. Getting to our, our family in Clemens, <laughs> My mother was a brewer, and her mother was a Phelps, and we all grew up together on Hampton Road, uh, about a mile below the middle of Clemens. And uh, our family, our the reason God's blessed us is because He He started way, way long time ago, and and my my mother's side of the side of the family founded what is now First Christian Church in Clemens. Used to be Muddy Creek Church of Christ, but it's First Christian Church in Clemens in 1882. And my grand, my granddaddy Brewer's family started Centenary Methodist Church on, on Hampton Road in 1883. And uh, both those churches are still in existence and both, you know, they're small churches. They're not great big churches, but they're still going on. So making a mess out of your life was not an option. We, did, we didn't have, we had family reunions and things like that. And you never heard any ugly words or anything. And there's no, no beer and no liquor or fussing and fighting or anything. And, Give you one example. My mother hated liquor so bad she could smell it over the phone. And I wanted to uh, be a little bit more specific about <clears throat> my granddaddy Brewer. He's the finest man I ever met, I'm sure. And uh, I stayed with him because my dad was trying to keep us from starving to death. And daddy was at work and we didn't live far from my grandparents and I went to their house every day. and. <clears throat> and my granddaddy had a pretty, pretty rough start. His parents died when he was five or six years old, and there was five or six children in the family. And the older children took a, took another ch a brother or sister. They all took a brother or sister. And when it came down to my granddaddy, there was nobody to take him. So there he was, and there wasn't any children's home or no welfare system or anything like that. So this <clears throat> family, the fellow's name was Wes Heggy, over close to Arcadia on Highway 158, uh, 150. Uh, and he and his wife found out that my granddaddy didn't have a place to live and he's five or six years old. That's a pretty bad start. And so they, they found out about that and so they came over, and no relation to us or anything, but they came over and got my granddaddy. And I just found this out about two weeks ago from Travis Haynes, who's a Haynes cookie guy in Clemens, and he's 91 years old, and I was telling him about my granddaddy. <clears throat> and, he, and he told me, he said, well, let me add a little bit to that story. And I said, okay. And he said, Wes Hagee that and his wife that took your granddad and raised him 
somebody took Wes Hagee's wife, she was in the same shape as your granddaddy, and somebody took her and raised her as an or pretty much an orphan. Her, her parents had died, so I expect she had a big part in that, but they raised my granddaddy until he was 17 years old. And that's, that's, a, that's a pretty big, I think that's a pretty big, a, a, a slow start, but a good ending. And uh, that's the way people used to do back then. They just helped each other. I want to tell a little bit, a little bit about my early childhood and, and my, my mother and daddy's start. It was pretty slow. We didn't, we didn't have anything. We were poor folks and I never went to bed hungry and I never slept in a house with a leaky roof or anything like that, but we, did, we didn't have anything. And uh, we, we lived in a rented house uh, for a couple of years. And uh, my daddy worked on a Guernsey dairy farm in Clemens. And he worked so hard, he went to work at 3.30 a.m. And he and one other guy milked 33 cows three times a day by hand. They milked 99 cows and they milked at 3.30 a.m., at 11.30 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. And they bottled all that milk and processed it and cleaned it all up. And he worked 18 hours a day and he got one dollar, that's six cents an hour. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty slow start. And uh, so we, we built, my daddy and mother built a house in 1941 on the acre and a half of land that my grandparents, my granddaddy Brewer gave up my mother and daddy and they built a house and it, and it was a one bedroom house. And uh, we didn't, like I said, we didn't have anything. So we didn't, we didn't have an inside toilet or anything. And my, my bedroom was the bathroom, which is a width of a five foot bathtub and seven feet long. And that was my bedroom until I was 15 years old. And we, um, we didn't have a hot water heater in the house or anything. We put water on the kettle on the stove if we wanted hot water. and. Uh, and if the bathroom caught on fire, it didn't affect the house because it was 75 feet outside. My, my daddy's baby brother <clears throat> went to the Second World War when it started at 18 years old. And he spent four years and nine months in Guam, Iwo Jima, and Guadalcanal. And uh, he was in the, in the Battle of Iwo Jima when they did all that stuff. And, he said, I didn't, I didn't help put the flag up or anything, but I could have touched it. And uh, when the war was over, they brought him back to Fort Bragg and we went down there. We were poor folks and so we didn't have much money, but we'd go down there about once a month and see him. And this boy was laying in bed, and one bed, you just walk between beds and, and just laying in there like stove wood and all of them were casualties of the, some kind, some part of the war. And when he just probably eight months to a year, he was in cert down in Fort Bragg in the hospital. And when he got out, he came to our house and he stayed, he slept on the couch cause I was in that little five by seven bathroom and he slept on our couch for four or five years, I guess, till he got married. And uh, so he, he, he lived a long time, but he had all kind of tropical diseases and everything, and he didn't, he didn't have any good days. The first downfall, the bad thing that really happened, uh, I don't know whether I was seven years old or eight years old, but I was not very far in school, and about 10.30 one morning, I was trying to get up out of bed, and. I was, I guess, like a, what you'd think of as a drunk. I'd try to get up and sit up in the bed, and I'd fall back over in the bed, and then I'd try again, and I finally got oriented enough to get up, and I, I just stumbled and staggered around through the house, and I went to check on my mother, and I couldn't get her awake, and uh, so 
the result of that was we had a, a round pot-bellied stove in the middle of the kitchen in the house and we had we put coke in that that most people don't know what coke is but it was a byproduct of coal and we filled that up at night and it would burn all night so we'd have a little bit of heat in the next morning well that night the fire had just about gone out and uh, it created carbon monoxide poisoning and almost well my daddy took my mother and I to the doctor he got he came home from work about 11 o'clock and we put wet rags on mother and everything and got her to going again and the doctor diagnosed this is that we were both of us were almost killed with carbon monoxide poisoning so that was that was a bad start but the good lord brought us through that so that along with many other things and uh, I was I'll tell you a little bit about Clemens I was I was born in Clemens and and for the people that know where Hampton Road is it's one of the main roads going out of Clemens south now and Louisville Clemens Road is the main road going towards Interstate 40 and towards Louisville and when I was a little boy both those roads were dirt and now Louisville Clemens Road is five lanes and uh, all the most all of the land uh, well there was there was a couple stores at the intersection of Lusso Clemens Road and 158 and there's two little old lanes two little old lanes of road and one of them had a furniture store on one side of the road and in an old grocery store and hardware store on the other side and if two cars came along they could meet in between those in between those two stores but if a if a car and a tractor and trailer came in there one of them had to wait till the other one got out of the way before they could before they could get, they couldn't both meet in there that's how narrow the little road is and and you look at it now and it's five lanes so it's it's changed a, a little bit and uh for the people that know where my office is that used to be my granddaddy's brother's cornfield and there was a big old popper tree behind there at the end of that field and it had a spring coming out of that popper out from under that popper tree there was a spring coming out of the ground and there was a stick stuck in the ground and there was a tin cup on that stick and everybody walking up and down Louisville Clemens Road to stop there at that spring and get them a drink of water I don't think the health department ever knew anything about it at about seven years old I guess maybe eight, probably seven. I was telling you about my uncle that came home from service. He worked at a bicycle shop in Winston-Salem and I wanted a bicycle so bad. And he worked over there and, and they had a bicycle that he liked for me and that, that bicycle was, was $5. And so I worked all summer long just whatever I could do as a little boy and, and I got four dollars together and it was time to go back to school and I there my bicycle was and I would owe a dollar I couldn't get my bicycle out so my my uncle gave me he gave me a dollar and so I got my bicycle out and that was one of the greatest days of my life you know get my little bicycle out and uh, I didn't have that thing very long till I decided I needed a, I needed a basket to carry stuff in so I bought I think I, I think I bought a used a bicycle basket that you tie on the front of the handlebars and uh, I think I paid 50 cents somebody had that and I just I think I paid 50 cents for that and uh, they didn't build a lot of houses wasn't many houses going on in but I would go around to the building contractors and and tell them that I'd clean up all the copper, little sha little shavings and little small pieces of copper, foot long and stuff. I said, if you let me have that copper, I'll clean it up, and you won't have to pay an employee to clean up, clean all that up. And so all of them did that. So I'd I'd ride up and down the road, and somebody would 
putting in plumbing and stuff where well, I'd get all that copper and clean it up and take it home and being a cousin of mine, we we put it in a pile and his daddy had a pickup truck and we get about you know half a load or something I guess and we get five or six or seven dollars, take it to the junk yard and we get five or six or seven dollars, maybe once in a while ten dollars and, and we split that money, you know. And uh we got together twenty five dollars and they used they always in the fall of the year they had the fair in which they still have the fairs around but they was a Joey Chitwood hail drivers and they did acrobatic stuff with cars. They'd turn them over side by side and end over end and just every which way. And everybody wanted to see that. And so they had a, we, we found out about that and we talked to his daddy into taking us over there on a Saturday afternoon to see that hell driver thing. And so they had a 35 Ford four door sedan and they turned it over sideways five times and end over end two times and just tore that car all through pieces. And so my cousin and I talked to his daddy and let's go down and, and see the people that run the show. And uh, so we did that and they said they'd take $25 for that car. So we took our $25 and, and we came home, got a trailer and hauled that thing home and we took, we, we worked on it, both of us little boys and, and his daddy helped us a little bit. We cut the, cut the body off of it, right, cut the windshield off right at the bottom of the windshield and, and cut the whole body off, left the, the front fenders were gone and the back fenders and we made a bed go right behind the front seat. We made a bed on the thing and made it into sort of a little pickup truck and left the seat in it. So we drove it everywhere and uh, and Clint, or I did, I was two years older than he was, and I, I, I thought I was a big shot, you know, I was about 11 years old then, probably, and I'd slip up to the store and get a drink, and I wasn't supposed to be driving, you know. And they'd catch me once in a while and say, you better get back down there where everybody's family. But anyhow, uh, we had a good time with that thing. And uh, <clears throat> another thing that I did along that same line, or in the same time period, we had a, a, a little old barber shop, well, there was a service station there in Clemens, and, uh, and there, there was a barber shop in there, <clears throat> and I'd go up to the barber shop on Saturday morning, and that's one reason I need that basket for my, bi for my bicycle. I, I had a guy that worked with my daddy, and he made me a little shoe shine box, and then you put your foot up on, and he it was really neat. He was creative, and so I put all my shoe shine stuff in that, and I put it on my bicycle. And I got up there when they had when they opened the barber shop at eight o'clock on Saturday morning, and and I shined shoes for ten cents a piece. And uh, they was a lot of folks won't remember Fred Bingham, but he was an elderly fellow. Well, he wasn't elderly then, but he's been dead a long time, and he was a successful businessman, and, and he would always, he'd give me a quarter for shining his shoes, so I thought he'd hung the moon, you know, and uh, so I'd, I'd do that till 12 o'clock, and, and then I'd go home, and, and my mother, <clears throat> my mother ran Wilson's Flower Shop, and my daddy, did not believe in anything but work. He just, he was a workaholic. He, and that's worse than an alcoholic. I was, I, it's gotta be worse than an alcoholic cause he never stopped. But we had, mother ran the flower shop and I, as a little boy, I raised plants outside. I raised potato plants and sweet potato plants and uh, pansy plants, and all kind of pepper plants, all kind of stuff that you plant in a garden. and and in a yard, and I, I raised all that for my mother, and of course she got all the money, and and just to help us get along, you know. And uh, so I did all that, all that kind of stuff outside. And I had a favorite customer, <clears throat> and which he was everybody's favorite. His name was John Whitaker, and he was the CEO 
of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, and we, we were friends, and he's he's still got a they still got a family place, I guess. He lived on Robin Hood Road before you get out to the shopping center out there, and that was all country back then. We, it was there wasn't any houses. He had a he bought a big farm, and uh, he would always buy at least a thousand pansy plants, and one of his things was, he said, I'm not going to buy the pansy plants if you don't send George with them. And so it'd take me about two hours to take those plants over and we, he and I would talk and he'd show me all around the farm and he's just a wonderful guy. And uh, I thought a lot of him, but he was a regular customer and he'd buy a thousand or twelve hundred pansy plants. When I was twelve years old, I, I, mowed, I mowed yards and had a and most people won't know what I'm, they won't have a clue what I'm talking about, but I had a real type lawnmower with no mo no motor, and it was the hardest thing in the world to push to mow. And, and I, mowed, I mowed our yard and a couple of the neighbor's yards and everything, and people wanted me to mow their yard, and it, it was such hard work, and I was, I was 12 years old. And this, my daddy didn't, still didn't have anything, but he bought me a, a real type lawnmower that would pull itself and gave me for my 12th birthday. And I, I bought, I, I mowed five yards a week for $5 each. And I mowed at Clemens Baptist Church yard and cemetery and hand clipped every grave in the cemetery and our sitting there in Methodist Church down in Davidson County and did the same thing for the churchyard and the graveyard. And I got $25 each out of those. So, at, and I didn't think anything about it until many, many years later and Gene Hooch and I were talking about it. And uh, we, uh, I made, I made $75 a week when I was 12 years old. And he said nowadays that'd probably be equivalent to like $975 a week. But I, and I saved almost all of that money. I, you know, being a young boy, I didn't have, I didn't, I didn't drink much liquor or smoke many cigarettes back then. So I didn't have to spend any. And I saved enough money that summer to the first, car I bought was $475 and I, I may have saved enough but close to enough to buy that car that summer as I said in my prayer all that's a, we had some downfalls and <clears throat> breakdowns but God helped us get through that and by the grace of God I was able to work and, <clears throat> and do uh, a lot of that stuff and uh, I was going to say this before now but I'll I'll just insert this right quick. I was talking to somebody not long ago that I hadn't seen in a year or two, and they said, what are you doing with your life, George? And I said, well, I said, I'm living a dream. I said, I've, I've had a good times and bad times, but <clears throat> I said, I'm finishing out, I'm 85 years old, and I'm finishing out a dream that I can't believe. And uh, and one of the one of the thing one of the well a lot of a lot of us a lot of us good but Gene Hoots and I have been friends for 75 years and and God has blessed us and we I expect we love each other more than a lot of brothers and I, and I'm gonna hesitate about talking about a lot of my friends because I got a lot of friends and I don't want to leave somebody out but I've been I've been blessed and I am, <clears throat> I am living the the ending, I don't, I don't know when it's going to end, but I'm living out a dream and it's more precious now than ever. Another interesting thing, I, I graduated in 1956 and I was the last person to graduate from Clemens School. It was, I said something about Clemens, the village of Clemens, but uh, Clemens School started in 1926 and and it closed in 1956 when they consolidated the schools. And uh, our class has done an 18 foot cabinet of the history of Clemens, High, of Clemens School, not 
this high school because it was 12 grades then, but we we made a, a, a lot of stuff that's interesting to look at, and we made a, we put a board up of everybody that ever went to Clemens School from 1926 to 1956, and the first person to ever register to go to Clemens School was one of my mother's first cousins, and I was the last one. I thought that's so interesting that one member of our family was the first one in, and I was the last one out. So that was that was sort of interesting. And we had we had 35 students in our graduating class, and. Uh, so that, that's, I guess they got, I don't know, they probably got that many in, they got that many in each grade now, and probably 30 to 35 won't learn much. But anyhow, uh, I graduated, like I said, in, in 56, and I went to Reynolds Tobacco Company every day for five weeks trying to get a job. And I think that I figured it out, but it's a long time after that. I think these guys that own these big companies would not hire each other's employees is what I sort of feel like happened. Anyway, I didn't get a job, and I went to the Bonson Company uh, down off, off of South Main Street, and they did heating and or air conditioning and dehumidifying and stuff in these big plants. And I went to work down there I don't know that I worked there a year, but I probably worked close to a year. And I was, I went to work there for a dollar an hour, and I brought home forty-six dollars and something. And I worked all the overtime; they let me work. But just a regular work week, I brought home forty-six dollars and fifty or sixty cents, something like that, in my salary. And I put twenty-five dollars of that in the bank and. Most people don't put over 50% of their money in the bank today, I doubt. But I'd say because I knew that I was going to need it later on in life. And, and while I was working there, I was thinking, you know, just as a young boy, you think about it. And I started thinking about this before I graduated from high school. I'll back up a little bit. But it really rang a bell when I got to the Bonson Company. And I said to myself, uh, I said, you know, at, at a dollar an hour, if I'm ever going to amount to anything, I've got to make more than a dollar an hour. I'm going to have to live to be 150 years old, one of the two. So I decided, and, uh, and uh, like I said, I'll back up a little bit because I, I had decided in 1955 when I was 17 years old because we never had anything, and I decided that that you know you got to if you're going to make a living and have a family and stuff some boys you watched them and they would drink beer and carouse around at night and spend everything until it's 25 years old before they ever decide to get get their head on straight and go to work and i decided and gene hoots and i talked about that some too back then and i decided i didn't need to wait till i was 25 years old to figure out if, what I was going to do with my life. <clears throat> and so uh, I, uh, and, and a lot of our students, especially the in ones that graduated in 55, if they got a job at Reynolds Tobacco Company, and the ones in 56 as well, if they got a job at Reynolds Tobacco Company, they went to, they went to Modern Chevrolet and bought a 55 or 56 or 57 Chevrolet and paid $2,500 or $3,000 and bought it on time and paid payments for it. And and I looked at that and I said, well, I could, you could do that, but I'm not sure that's the way that I want to do it. So I didn't buy a new car. I, I bought a an old used lumber truck that was, that was worn out and uh, I bought it and started hauling lumber from a sawmill and started working for myself. And uh, I had all kind of breakdowns, tires blowing out because the old truck was old. And 
and I got I had a blowout one day, one Saturday, blew a tire out, and I took the tire and rim over to Sears, and they put me a new tire on my on my rim, and I put it in my daddy's station wagon, and brought it back to Clemens, and I put it on the truck, and I got about three quarters of a mile, and they didn't put the rim on right, and I got to the first curve, and the the rim blew off and wrecked my truck and uh, threw me out of the truck and tore my truck up, just tore it all to pieces. It, in fact, it, it it threw me out on the ground and made a mud hole where I, it was raining. And it tore up my truck so bad I had a two gallon thermos jug in the flo front floorboard of that truck. And when I got to feeling better and got to where I could get to going, uh, I had to, they tore my cab up so bad I had to take a seat out to get my thermos bottle out, thermos jug out of that floorboard of that truck. And they took me to the hospital and they told me that my back was broke, that I, you know, and they did like they always do, they harness you up on all this stuff, you know, and look after you. And I told them, I said, my back's not broke, uh, but anyhow, and it turned out not to be broken. And so there I was $450 in debt and no truck and no money and no job. So when I got a week or so, when I got to where I could get out and walk and go a little bit, I went to two of my friends that I eventually bought into their business with them. And they had another truck and so I they told me that they'd let me have that truck for $850. So there I owed about, I owed $1,375 and no job and no truck or no nothing. So I got, I got to work, working day and night to try to pay, get all that paid for. And, and, uh, and I did, and it didn't, it didn't take me too long because I worked I worked six days and half of six nights for a week to try to, because I had to pay all that, pay all that off. I, after I got both my trucks paid for, I found a, a sawmill. And some people won't know what a sawmill is, but I found a new sawmill, and I was I was taking the the lumber truck and just hauling lumber from a sawmill to the lumber plant. And I was getting about uh, $5 a thousand. So I was getting about 50 or $60 or 70 a day. And uh, so I got a chance to buy a, a sawmill and this is, this this wouldn't happen today. So I had a, well, he was everybody's friend. He was a banker and I was 19 years old. And, I got a chance to buy a sawmill for $3,000 and so I went to him and I said, I need $3,000 and I don't need you to take any out of, any, out of interest. I need $3,000 to buy this sawmill. So we, uh, he just slid me a note over there and I signed it and, uh, and took the $3,000 and, and bought the sawmill. So then I could do the whole process. I could cut the tree down and saw it and deliver the lumber to the lumber plant. And uh, I don't know whether they ever told anybody much, but I'd find most of the big lumber companies wanted to buy a big piece of land, a big piece of timber. And I'd find, I'd find somebody that had three or four or five acres that they didn't want to fool with, you know, and I'd buy that. And, and I'd cut, I'd buy the timber, so I'd make a little bit of money that way on the timber, and and uh, a little bit over my labor, I made a little bit of profit on the timber as well as as the uh, as just as just my labor bill. And this this is sort of an interesting story, but up on on 52 North at Highway where Highway 65 is. I bought that where that interchange is. I bought all that where that interchange is. I bought all that. It was, it was covered up in small timber. And the guy told me, he said, "Now they're gonna tear everything up. Said get everything you can." So I cut 
and he had some rabbit dogs and so I cut everything I could cut because they were going to tear it up anyway and so the neighbors talked bad about me up there they said that when I left up there said that guy had some rabbit dogs and he didn't even have a stick to whip his dog with I cut them all up in the lumber <laughs> so that was that was sort of sort of a funny story and uh, like I said things weren't they weren't I weren't really highly successful but I worked hard and, and on rainy days a lot of the sawmill men would sit around the store and tell lies and tales and everything and on rainy days I'd go to <clears throat> these lumber companies around scattered around and they they had dry oak and they sold it to furniture factories and stuff and I sort of figured out what it, what it, what you needed to do to do that so I'd go around to these lumber companies on rainy days and I'd buy a load of lumber from them and they didn't have to all they had to do was me hand them the money and uh, I'd load it they'd I'd back up underneath of a shed it'd be raining or something I'd load a load of lumber and I'd take a lot of it went to B.F. Huntley Furniture Company in Winston Salem and they had a market in Marksville, Virginia furniture plant and I'd make about a hundred dollars or a hundred and fifty dollars a load on a load of lumber and so I'd I'd work when the rest of the guys was all sitting around the store talking because cause I needed the money. And uh, and then another thing that I did along that same line, uh, I liked old tractors and stuff like that. And I'd buy old red belly Fords and farm all cubs. And I'd pay $400 or $450, probably not over $550, and I'd make $100 or a $150 on those. I'd buy those on rainy days and, and wax them and clean them up and shine them up. And if there's a little something wrong with them, I'd fix them and I'd make a $100, $150 on those because I, 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 I knew I wanted sometimes to have a family and, and it's going to cost a lot of money. So I, I kept working just uh, sort of like the cat eating the grindstone. It was slow, but I kept going. I came home from work one Thursday evening late and, and I worked I worked from before daylight till after dark and I came home I came home from work one that of course I was not married or anything I came home from work one Thursday afternoon and I had a half a tank of gas in my lumber truck and it it was an hour drive down to the High Rock Lake I had a half a tank of fuel in my truck and I had a dollar bill in my pocket and that's all I had and I I'd had no way to get any money till Friday or Friday or Saturday so I couldn't go to work I couldn't get my employees to work or anything so I went to the table to eat that night and I ate about three or four bites because I was sick and when I got through eating I I took two chainsaws and I went down down the road to the store and got to talking to some fellows and stuff and so I you know I had to do I had to do something I just I knew I couldn't make it the next day and I'd be I was broke I just didn't have sense enough to know it and uh, so I messed around the store there a little while and I I sold one chainsaw and made another trade for some locust post and so when I came back home about nine o'clock that night I had one chainsaw that I could still use the next day and I had a a hundred and forty nine dollars in money in my pocket so I was going that wasn't going to put me out of business I managed to I managed to get by so that was a low that was a low about as low down as you could get financially I told somebody I said if I'd have got any lower down than that, I'd have had to get a step ladder and look into the rattlesnake's eyes. So that was a, that was the low point in my financial days, I guess. I mean, I know it was. I'll never I'll never forget that day. And uh, after after I told you about my truck wreck and and I bought some timber up above Moxville, and we were cutting the timber out 
and I did whatever it took, whatever nobody else would do, I'd do that. So I was pulling a pulling a log out from down underneath of a hill, and I got to the top of the hill, and I hit a, I hit a little there's a little terrace there, and, and the tr front end of the tractor was raised up, and I went over that terrace, and the tractor turned over backwards on me and landed on my chest, and mashed me against the log. And I could I could breathe I could I could get my breath and I didn't break any bones and that but there I was and the battery acid was running out on my t-shirt and I and the gasoline was running out on my bathing trunks that I had on they, the battery acid was eating up my trunks and so I had a guy helping me and I said you go get the guys at the sawmill over and get this tractor off of me before it catches on fire and burns me up. So they, he went hurrying over there and they raised that tractor up enough that I could slide out from underneath the steering wheel. And, 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 not, and it didn't catch, did not catch on fire, which is a, another gift from God. I took, I took my lumber to Bingham and Parks Lumber Company over on Highway 158 and was associated with those boys cause I'd known them all my life and, uh, so they, after a little while, I mean, they'd known me all my life, and they offered me an interest in their lumber company, and uh, I said, well, maybe that's maybe that's the way to get there a little quicker than 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 I'm going now. So I bought a what I call was a minimal. I didn't I didn't own a third of the lumber company, but I bought in what I thought I could afford to buy, and I bought into the lumber company, and we were only in the lumber business then, and then we got in the building supply business a little bit, and uh, this is a, another God thing. Uh, there was a gun club over at Clemens, and it was a Winston-Salem gun club, and it was just a skeet field. They shot clay targets to skeet, and one of my partners was a real good skeet shooter, and uh, nobody could find any targets. And so we were hauling lumber. We were hauling lumber from from here locally up into Virginia and over into West Virginia. And we went all we went all the way to the Ohio River, and so we found out we we couldn't you know you couldn't. You couldn't run your gun club if you didn't have any targets to shoot at. So our Bobby D. Parks, who was in, he he was the shooter in the company, and uh, he got hooked up with Remington Arms in Finley, Ohio, and they made clay targets, and talked them into selling us a load of targets. And so we'd haul a load of lumber. I I did some of it myself. Haul a load of lumber up there and and deliver it there when especially when it's going as far as the Ohio River and uh, then we'd drive up to Finley, Ohio and take some more boards and nail on the side and bring back ever how many targets, I don't know what, what we brought back, probably 200 cases on a lumber truck. So we had targets and uh, so we'd have a shoot over at Clemens and people would come to our gun club because we had targets and they couldn't get targets so they got to want to know how to what they could do to get targets so we just we kept doing that and uh, and then we wound up with a truck that we didn't haul lumber up or we just took an enclosed truck and go up there and get a load of targets and that got to doing pretty good and so we got in touch Mr. Parks got in touch with Winchester. They had the best clay targets. So we got in touch with Winchester and they had seen that we were selling targets. So we we started buying, they gave us a distributorship. They had distributorships and everything everybody did, I guess. So they gave us a distributorship and targets only. That's all they let us have. So we started hauling targets and well, make a long story short we were we, we phased our way out of the lumber business and was getting stronger in the gun business and so we got 
we started off with just targets, and then they had they had an ammunition distributorship, and they had a gun distributorship, and all the stuff that goes along with it. So <clears throat> it just kept growing and growing, and uh, so we wound up with everything that Winchester had, and and we had all the major gun companies in America, and. Uh, we had all the powder companies. We had distributorships for everything that there was. And so we just got out of the lumber business and got into the gun business. And we were, <clears throat> we've had every military base. Uh, we took, we sold them all their, what I call their fun guns, not their military guns, military ammo, but for their, for their for their fun stuff at their gun clubs and stuff, all the military bases from Washington, D.C. to the Mississippi River in Florida in nine states. We had exclusive rights to all those places and sold them all their stuff. So we, in the, in the end, we wound up running 15 factory and trailers up and down the road with just gun supplies. And we sold everything that was had anything to do with a gun except clothes and uh, and and I got I, I did we, in our company at WD Parks he ran the office and did the paperwork and everything and Donald Bingham was a second partner or I was a third partner but anyhow he he was a pretty good mechanic and everything so Donald looked after all the equipment all the trucks the tractors and trailers and all that, and he looked after all that, and I looked after all the sales and everything, and uh, that's what helped us a lot. And uh, I, I heard this, and I didn't read it in the Bible, but they tell me that there's two lines going into heaven, and I'd never heard that in 85 years. And, and one line has a sign over the door, and it says, if you if your wife was a boss when you were alive on earth, you stand in this line. So, you know, that line went over the hill and down the hill and over a couple more hills. And and then there's another door down below that. And it said, the sign on that door said, if you were the boss while you were alive on earth, you stand in front of this door. And so there was one little old 90 pound man stand down there by himself, you know, nobody down there but him. And so St. Peter asking people, say, what's your name? And he'd say, well, my name is Jim Brown. And he said, well, I, I got you down here. You qualified to come in. And he said, I need to ask you a question. And they said, what's that? And he said, were you the boss when you were alive on earth? And he said, no, my wife was the boss. And so that just went on and on. and. Every little bit, St. Peter would look down there, and that little old man would stand down there by himself. They'll stand there, hadn't been let in. So eventually, he told everybody, he said, Yo, just gotta wait. He said, That little old fellow's been standing down there for so long, I've got to let, go talk to him and let him in. So he went down there, and he said, Sir, I said, what, what's your name? And he said, My name is Bill Smith. So he looks on the list, and he said, Yeah. He said, You're right here. He said, you're qualified to come in, but he said, I need to ask you a question before you come in. He said, what's that? He said, were you the boss while you're alive? You're standing in this line. Were you the boss while you're alive on earth? He said, no, sir. My wife told me to stand here. <laughs> so, that, you just, you're young now, just remember that. <laughs> now I need to talk about my, my well, she was my, Sweetheart, then I guess she still is. I don't know what. Don't ask her. But anyhow, her name. She's got two names. Her city name is Eleanor, and her country name is Jeep. And she won't like this part, but I'm gonna tell you where the Jeep came from. She worked at Tanglewood at the horse barn, and uh, down there, if everybody knows where Tanglewood is, where the barns used to be. Well, the barns are still there, but they don't have horses, I don't think. But anyhow, they had a they had a jackass over there, and the jackass's name was Jeep. And that jackass and my 
they they named her Jeep after that jackass because that jackass loved Jeep to death and he'd come up and get in the very corner of the fence closest to the road when he'd hear her little old car. She had a little old Fiat and he'd hear her car coming. He'd get up there to the closest he could get to the corner and meet her and then run back to the barn with her. So that's where she got the country name of Jeep and so I got acquainted with her at the service station in different places and she was sort of shy and, and uh, we got to talking and and she had a a little old Fiat car that might have been worth $50 if somebody left a $20 bill laying on the front seat. That thing wasn't worth nothing. It broke down every week and I told people I just felt sorry for her. So I took her out to get her a hot dog and a cup of coffee and that didn't cost much. And so I kept doing that. And there's a guy down there where the Reynolds tobacco plants used to be. He had a calf roping and they do that every Tuesday night, I think. And so she got to, she got to liking that. So she and I got to going to the calf roping and, and then that, of course she got to the Jeep name from the jackass, and uh, we we got to Dayton, and I tell people I felt sorry for because she didn't have any way to get to work, and that little old Fiat broke down every week. I finally bought her a 55 Ford, to use 55 Ford so she could get to work. Uh, but anyhow, we uh, we dated a couple years, I guess, and. Uh, we have two daughters, and uh, I told them I didn't have any boys, but I said, if y'all are any good, you can get me a couple boys. So they got me a couple son-in-laws, and I got, and, uh, I got uh, a granddaughter, and she's on a two-year mission trip in Southeast Asia, and a grandson, and he's married, and he has two two young boys, three and a half and five. So God's blessed us in many ways right there and there's nobody in jail and and uh, so that's another blessing. And then I forgot when I was talking about, I, I forgot something when I was talking about graduating from high school. I guess it's not too late to enter this in. My daddy never did have anything and and he said he'd go borrow the money for me to go to college if I wanted to go to college. And I said, no, you don't have the money and I'm not going, and you're not going to borrow the money for me to go to college. And I don't want to go that bad anyhow. And if I want to go, I can work my way through college by myself. And uh, so he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'll make you two promises. And he says, what's that? I said, I'll stay out of your pocketbook and I'll stay out of jail. He said, I believe I'll take that. So, so that's, that's, that's where we were. And uh, I guess one thing that I need to add to Jeep's part of the story is that her, her mother met her dad during the, well, it, I guess it was before the Second World War, probably. Uh, she was over in England she was on a cruise, I think, and uh, she met her, which turned out to be her daddy. Her mother met her dad, and and they got they got married. And he was from Scotland, and he was in the Second World War, and they stayed over there. And and Jeep was born. She was born over. There. I guess I can get this straight. She was born over there, and she got a. I can't remember what it was, but some kind of pretty bad disease uh, when she was two weeks old. And her grandmother got, I, I think it was Queen Elizabeth, anyhow, a cruise ship. She went over there to bring her back because they had close ties to Baptist Hospital. And uh, so she went over there and brought she and her mother back and when they and the war was just beginning to start and uh, so they they'd stopped all the cruise ships and everything 
from traveling because this was right at the, right at the, she was born in 1939, so this was right at the beginning of the war. I think that's right. And uh, so they got, some way or another, they got hooked up on a, not on a cruise ship, but on a, on a ship, a cargo ship. And they put some bunk beds and stuff in there and they brought a certain amount of people that that didn't get on the ships that were coming before they stopped all that. And so she and her, her mother and her grandmother got on that ship and came back and they, it's a sort of funny part of the story. It wasn't funny because her health was bad and it was just a baby. But there was a woman that wrote a book while they were on that, coming back to America. And there was a woman that wrote a book about a screaming baby all the way across the ocean, and that was Jeep. So that's, that's sort of the funny part of, of that story. And so and I thought that was, that was worth mentioning because they were blowing up ships and submarines and everything else, and they could have not, I could have not had a wife if something like that had happened. So I'm blessed again. In 1980, I left the company that I was with from 60 to 80, uh, 20 years, and decided to go out on my own. And uh, one of my partners had a young son, and he was a teenager, and he wanted to bring him into the company. So I just sold him my interest and moved over to Clemens and opened a, a retail store. We were in the wholesale business before that, and I opened a retail store so he could bring his son into the company. And I stayed there until 1987. And uh, I took our, our, our best secretary with me when I left. She came to, she came to work uh, with us in 1973 when I'd had my major surgery and this bag put on my side. So. When I left in 1980, she came with me, and this year she's still with me. And this year in in March would would have, was 50 years that she's and she's still working, and she'll be 80 years old in August the 13th. So we we managed to get along pretty good for a long time. After about 47 years, I told her, I said, you've been on trial long enough, I'm gonna put you on full time. So that's three years ago. We talked about our friendships and the people I've met. I've got 1,219 numbers on my cell phone. And a lot of these folks were gun customers throughout all those years that we were in the gun business. And, and they were all over the world. I knew from five people to 200 in every state in the United States and four or five different foreign countries, and uh, and I, I met all those as a as a result of the gun business, and some of them that I, some of them were telephone friends that I never met. People that are 75 and 80 years old, guys that I out in the Midwest and places that had guns since they were in the 20s and 30s, and they sold them in the 60s and 70s, and. I bought guns from them, sent them checks, and never met them except by phone. But I wouldn't take anything for that relationship. And of course, a lot of the people I met at a big show, uh, shoot in Dayton, Ohio every year. So I went there about 20 years, and people were there from everywhere. And the thing that backs that up a little bit, I had a lot of friends, but with Richard Budd and Robin Hayes and Buddy Ledman and I used to go to Canada. We went duck and goose hunting and quail hunting, and so this is a funny story. They, they still talk about it. We left one day going to Canada, and we stopped, and Robin had a nice plane, and we landed in Rockford, Illinois, which is right outside of Chicago, and uh, I'd never heard tell of Rockford, Illinois, but we stopped in there, and went into fixed base operation and went to the bathroom and got some fuel and stuff. And we walked in there and 
bunch of guys holler and said, George, what are you doing out way out here in Illinois? And they'd been out west hunting. And so they were on the way back and we were on the way to Canada. So we met them and visited with them a little bit. And so we left there and we went over into Canada and we had to go in a town that had customs. So we stopped and checked ourselves into Canada. We were told we were gonna go hunting and the same thing happened. We ran into some people that had been out west hunting and they were, they were there in the airport doing the same thing. So that evening we went into the motel to register into the motel and we ran into the same thing in the restaurant. People that I knew that were gun customers so we ran into them and talked to them. And it happened everywhere we went and so we we left there after a week and we flew back to into Minot, North Dakota to come through customs and we were coming through customs and uh, we went to a, a, a boat, we went to a motel and we were going to eat at the motel and the guy that was there had us come out there and said no we're going down the street so we the guy that owned the motel I mean uh, not the motel but he owned the restaurant across the street in a stockyard so we went over there and ate a wonderful dinner and uh, met some people there so we left there and we went to Yankton South Dakota and that's in southeast South Dakota and so we were in the sporting goods store waiting to get a three-day non-resident permit so we could pheasant hunt. And so there was about 30 people in line and Robin said, well, George said, I got you now. I said, you won't know anybody in this, gun, in this gun shop. And about that time, two guys, about 20 people behind us hollered and said, George, what are you doing out here? <laughs> Robin said, I give up, and it was a doctor and another customer of mine from Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and they'd flown out there to hunt just like we did, so that was a, that was a funny story. They still tell that, and so the next year, I didn't go with them, and Richard Budd went to New York and on business, and then he flew on into Canada, and he got ready to catch a plane in New York City to go to Canada, and he met somebody and told him he was from North Carolina, and they said, well, do you know George Wilson? And he said, so it started over on, without me along, you know, and so they had the same thing happen, and, and it happened two or three more times while they were on their trip, and when they found out they were from North Carolina, everybody knew me, so that's, that's good. I made a lot of friends, and I'd rather have them than money. Well, and some, a couple of my friendships, of course, all of them mean a lot, and, including the people sitting here with us at the table now. Uh, but uh, I met Jerry Lewis, the comedian, came in my store one day, and uh, a, a mutual friend of ours, Jerry was married, and uh, he got a divorce. I don't know how old he was. He had five children, and he got a divorce, and, and he married a, a woman from Winston-Salem, so he went to uh, the, a golf course that's within a mile of where his new bride came from. And so this boy that ran the golf course, he said, I got somebody you've got to meet. And he said, well, let's go meet him. And so his name was Bill Jones. And so Bill brought him out to, out to my gun shop and brought him in, introduced him to me. And he told Jerry, he said, Jerry, he said, let me tell you something about George. And he said, what's that? He said, he's as crazy as you are, but he never charges anybody for his stories, and you do. So <laughs> that was sort of funny, and we got to be real close. And any time he came to visit Bill, of course, he and his new wife, she had family here, so they came right up. They came right off, and then when they, when they did, he'd always come and visit with me, and we had a a lot of stories that we told uh, together. And and then another thing that happened to me one morning at about three o'clock, my telephone rang. And uh, I thought, who in the world's calling me at three o'clock in the morning? So I answered the phone and it 
sounded like Jimmy Stewart. And I thought, the actor, and I said, well, what in the world? This sure does sound like Jimmy Stewart. And I said, I said, you sound like Jimmy Stewart. I said, are you Jimmy Stewart? He said, yeah. I said, well, I got one question. He said, what's that? I said, I'd like for you to tell me how you got my phone number when you're a famous California movie star. How did you get my phone number? And he said, I'm at your friend Jim Mabry's house in Jacksonville, Illinois, and, and we're having a few drinks. And I said, well, I didn't know you drank. He said, well, I, I'm not a drunk, but this is not my first drink. But he said, I said something to Jim and said, I want to call one of your friends and, and to let them know that I'm at your house. I'm your guest tonight. And he said, who do you want to call? And he said, well, I don't have but one person that wouldn't cuss you out this time of day, and it's George Wilson in North Carolina. So we talked, we talked for 45 minutes about different things, and he begged me to come to California, and he said, if you'll just come to California, he said, I'll, I'll raise the, I'll lay out the red carpet for you. In 1987, I had, I saw mail and all the things I've already told about, but I decided I wanted to get out from behind the counter. So I sold my business and I've always liked uh, real estate. I've always, I liked real estate and part of that was due to uh, Gene and my, one of our very best friends was Hal Bingham, who was in the, and his brother in the lumber and timber business and land business and stuff. And I just always liked land. And so I wanted to, and I started buying land. I may have told us, I think I have already told that in, his, in this interview, but he, uh, he, he was, meant a lot to me. And I spent a lot of time with him. My dad was at work trying to keep us from starving to death. So I spent a lot of time with Hal and I'll elaborate on this a little bit. I spent time with him and another guy was Red Harrison. And uh, they were all older and all smarter and they'd already fell in a bunch of holes and got beat up and banged up. And so they told me what to do not to fall in those holes. And, and then later on in life, I got connected up with Dwight Goforth, who was probably the biggest land man in the country. And uh, I always followed people like that that loved Jesus and loved people and, and were good at the same kind of things that, that I like to do. And now my wife says to me, said, well, they're all dead. Said, now who are you going to follow? So, I guess I don't have anybody to follow anymore. What a little bit I learned, I guess I probably never learned anything else. But anyhow, those folks really meant a, meant a lot to me. I bought my first piece of property in 1960 on the bank of the road uh, in Davie County. And there was probably 50 guys there. And, and uh, I bought 40 and a half acres at public auction and I paid $130 an acre for it. And the guy that was bidding against me found out he was bidding against me and I thought he was gonna cry. He said he wished he would, had known that I was more that piece of land, he wouldn't have bid against me. I said, well, I wish you'd have known it too. I'd probably got it for $100 an acre. But anyhow, I bought, I bought that piece of land and then anytime I get a few dollars ahead and I could find a piece of land where I'd buy it. And I, I bought a farm in the 70s. I bought it, there wasn't any road frontage on it. And uh, I bought a farm in the 70s, but well, it was about in the early 70s. And I bought it, it was 150 acres. And I bought the whole 150 acres for $6,500, total $6,500. That's the cheapest piece of land I ever bought. But anyhow, I uh, I was going. There was a proposed watershed lake on that land, and I was going to go over there and build a house. And I was really bad shape uh, physically. My health was really bad, and so uh, somebody came along and offered me sixteen thousand five hundred dollars for that piece of land. So I 
I was laying flat on my back in the hospital and didn't think I was going to live. And uh, so I, I, I sold it, for, and that's the only reason I sold it was for that, because I just I sold, I had some cattle and stuff, and so I sold that, not expecting to live, but the good Lord seen something else for me to do since then. I, I didn't have any, I didn't ever have any money, or not much money, and so I looked for partners, uh, somebody to finance me and let me find deals and and do them on a 50-50 basis. And I, I had five people that offered to finance me, and all five of them were crooks. Well, they were just pure crooks. They just rotten them. I turned all of them down, and uh, I said something to a boy one time, I don't know what year it was, and, and uh, I knew he was, I didn't, had no idea that it was going to turn out like this. Uh, and I said something to him, I said, if I had somebody to finance me and come up with the money, I could, I know I could be worth a lot more money because I can't, I can't pay for stuff with no money. So he said, well, I'll finance you, George, and just just out of the blue. And I'd known him a long time. He was a lumber broker. And uh, he said, I'll finance you. And so we were in the process of doing that. And he called me in about two weeks. And he said, George said, I got some bad news. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, I have terminal cancer. And he had about, uh, I don't know, 800 or 1,000 acres in Ash County. He wanted me to sell, first of all. And uh, he said, I'll finance you. And uh, so I said, well, that, well that's going to work out with us. That'd be wonderful. And I was up here about three weeks after that. And they, somebody called me on the phone and said he had died in three weeks with cancer. So. That deal didn't ever go through, so that was a that was a sort of an interesting story as well. The best deal, I guess, or could have been the best deal. Uh, I ran into Dwight Goforth, which I'd known Dwight for 30 years, I guess, and on the telephone and stuff, and we'd traded stuff when we were in the lumber business and and all kind of deals. And so when I got in the in the real estate business. Uh, Dwight and I got closer together, and and uh, we made a, we made a lot of deals, and uh, I won't go into the details of, of uh, all of them because there's too many of them. But I'd find a piece of land that had a little bit of profit left in it, and I'd call up Dwight and I'd say, Dwight, do you want this? I said, it's fifty thousand dollars this guy left on the table. I said, do you want it, or do you want me to call somebody else? And he was slow and easy going. He said, well, I'll take it. <laughs> so he and I one day met at Statesville at the Holiday Inn to eat lunch, and I was going to show him this piece of land that I had for sale. And uh, it was on the South Yadkin River, and so we were in there eating lunch, and the sheriff of Ardell County came over and sat down with us and ate lunch with us. And he said, what are you two getting into? And I said, well, i got to piece of land to show Dwight up the road here that he needs, probably needs to think about. And so he said, well, let me drive. And so Dwight always kept a new Sedan DeVille, red Sedan DeVille Cadillac. So the sheriff drove and we went up there and looked at that land and drove to a cow pasture and old weeds and vines and everything. Nobody used it lately. And we drove out to the edge of a hill and I told him, I said, don't go down that hill. I said, South Yadkin River's down that hill, and I said, you'll never get back up. And I told Dwight, I said, now that, the river's down at the bottom of this hill, and I said, while well, we're buying that, that'll be swamp land, but when we get it in your name, it'll be river frontage. And that sheriff laughed that big on death. He said, I'll give $100 a day just to get to ride with y'all. So I told him, I said, well, you give me the $100, and you'll be here tomorrow. Of course, he didn't do that, but. Anyhow, Dwight, uh, he was such a wonderful guy, and he wanted me and him to get in 
He wanted us to get into business together and I was, I don't know, I was 75 or 80, I get probably 75 years old and he was 81 or two, probably a little, little bit, maybe a little bit over 80 and he wanted us to get into business together and I said, well, Dwight, I said, that won't work. I said, we're too old. I said, we, we both old enough, a little something. We'll get something started and get something bought, and put together, halfway together, and then one of us will die, and nobody in our family will have a clue, and it'll take them forever to straighten it out. So we did not do that, and it wasn't but about a year after that, he fell dead in the floor at home, so it, that worked out good, but he was such a wonderful teacher and a, and a wonderful man. Then I ran after Dwight, I ran into a fella over in Wilkes County on the Wilkes and Watauga County line and he was doing the same thing that I was doing and I can't remember exactly who put us together but we got connected up and he said I want, I want you to go and I want to show you the prettiest place in America so we flew out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming and just across the mountain from Jackson Hole is the Idaho state line. A lot of people don't, if they haven't been out there several times, they don't even know that, but the, the Idaho state line is at the back of the Teton Mountains on the west side. So we went over there and looked at some land and he, he owned some land and a lot of the tracks out there are great big. And he already owned some land. He said, we need to, make an investment out here and so we uh, we bought a little bit of land not well we bought one piece together and then after that I bought a little bit of land and uh, there was a guy beside of us had 6,500 acres and he was a multi-billionaire from Florida and, and then the guy next to him was a multi-billionaire from San Diego and they had big tracks and of course, some of them have 50,000 acres and stuff, so we just bought small tracks. And we didn't do as good out there because they got, it's, it turned out to be the most liberal county in the state of Idaho. And they get all these people coming in from Arizona and California and places like that. And they put all these restrictions on the land and everything. And, and we bought our land for about $12,000 an acre. And, and when we bought that, it was bringing about $30,000 an acre, and I thought, well, there's a little profit left in there, and so, and as it turned out, uh, they just kept getting more liberal and more liberal, so I finally wound up sold my land because of the, of the county commissioners and also the, my age. I'm getting too old to go out there. I'll probably never go back, but that's it. On our, on our land, we had, I had 80 acres on the Teton River, and that, and you looked right straight at the Teton Mountains. It was centered up right in the center of the Teton Mountains. And if you get five miles away from the mountains, you can't see the Tetons. And so that was a, a pretty big plus to have that 80 acres. And then I had a couple more tracks that were small. And I sold all that. So I made a, I made a lot of friends out there. And, Idaho and Montana and Wyoming and stuff and right here where we're sitting now uh, my friend Richard Nichols we, he and I have been looking he lives over at Sparta and we've been friends forever and uh, we've been looking for some property in the mountains and years ago when I was sawmilling when I was 19 years old you could buy any land up and down the New River for fifty to a hundred dollars you could buy all you wanted to buy and I wanted I found some property that I wanted only I didn't have fifty dollars so <laughs> I didn't get to buy it but I uh, I just kept looking and and when when we found out about this place here Richard and Jeep and I came over here one Saturday and and drove down on the hill on the west end of this place and and uh, so it, we, it was it was on the market for sale, and so I said, "Well, I won't I won't be here when they held this sale." So the day of the sale, one of our 
real close young friends and his his wife to be were gonna get married on that day at the same day of the sale. And my wife told me, she said, you gotta go to the wedding. And I said, well, I generally don't tell you what I'm gonna do or what you got to do, but I said, today I'm gonna tell you. She said, what's that? I said, you be the family representative at the wedding because I'm gonna be the family representative at the sale. I'm gonna go up there and try to buy that some of that land. So we, uh, I, I did, I did that, and uh, it was a a god thing because we we I bought 90 acres that first day, and I've added some to it since then. But somebody asked me not long ago, said. Uh, how many acres do you have in the mountains? I said, we don't have any. I said, it belongs to the Lord. We're just a caretaker, and, and I'm not going to be a caretaker much longer. I about used up my, my time. So, But anyhow, just think about, and I've told a lot of people this, I said, I'm the luckiest man in the world because the product I sell is land, and that's made by the God. So that's pretty good. That's a pretty good story as far as I'm concerned. And they wouldn't have anything if it wasn't for him, and I give him the credit. And uh, so we, we, uh, and I'll add a little bit to this. This land that we're on now was an English land grant in the 200 years ago. The King of England granted this land to a family, and it had never been out of their name until I put my name on it. So I hope that we can keep it in our family for that long because it's, you know, here where it is, it's just a gorgeous place. And I've got a little gate down towards the road and it says almost heaven. And I tell folks that we can go to heaven without having to die. So that's, that's pretty good, I think. I started with a goal when I was 17 years old. I thought, well, you can wait till you're 18 or 20 or whatever you want to, to start achieving what you want to achieve in life. And I said, well, if I start at 17 or 18, I'll be two or three years ahead of the ones that start at 20 or 25 or something. So I always liked land as a result of looking at land with Hal Bingham. And uh, I really I really did like the, the land that God made for us. And I had a goal of, uh, I said, before I died, we grew up with nothing. And I said, I, before I die, I would like to have a, accumulate a thousand acres of land. Well, that's pretty, in 1955, that was a pretty big number. But I have, and time, time has made this happen and, and hard work. I just, I've never done anything but work. And I, I accumulated a thousand acres, so I got that done. I have had more than that, but now then I don't. Well, I still got a little more than that, but that was a goal that I set in 19, in 1955. Well, I, I've had a lot of health problems and just, you know, life deals some good blows and some bad blows, but God has been good to me and still good to me. and. Uh, when I was 19 years old, I was diagnosed with uh, uh, ulcerative colitis, and uh, I was in the hospital at least twice, in seven to 10 days every spring and every fall. And uh, so I just had had tough times and trying to work and do all the things that you need to do with a young family and everything. And uh, so in 1973, my doctor was, he was more like a daddy or a, bro or a brother than he was a doctor. And we were really close. And he said a few slang words once in a while. And I was in his office one day and he was checking on me and I wasn't doing very well. and. He told me, he said, George, he said, this damn thing's gonna kill you and it ain't gonna be long if we don't 
think you were inside out and put one of these bags on your side. And he says, I think we can, we, I don't think we waited too late. And, uh, but he said, we need to do that. And that was on a Friday. And uh, so I said, well, when, when can we do it? And so he got on the phone and called a chief surgeon at Baptist Hospital in Winston-Salem and made an appointment. So they put me in the hospital on Tuesday to take my insides out. And uh, so this is sort of interesting story. The guy was, he was a good friend too. And uh, so he came into my hospital room on Monday night said, how are you feeling, George? And I said, well, I feel good tonight. I'm glad you asked me tonight. Instead of tomorrow night, I won't feel so good. So uh, we talked a little bit, and I said, how much is this operation going to cost? He said, I don't know why. I said, well, I want to pay you tonight. I won't give you a check. And he said, well, nobody's ever offered to prepay for an operation. He said, what are you going to do that for? I said, well, I want to write you a check, and I want you to put it in your pocket or your shirt. And when I get to feeling better, I'll sign it. <laughs> so he got, he got tickled over that, you know. And he's a famous doctor, and he told me after that sometime, he said, uh, I made you famous. I told that story how you tried to prepay me everywhere I went. And uh, so uh, then we got, we got that fixed. And then in 19... 97, I had a, a physical, and I had a physical every year, and, and, I, and my doctor, he was a close friend too, and uh, he came in there after I went back to him after a, supposedly a, a, a complete physical, and he said, George, he said, what did they check on your heart? I said, nothing. I said, I begged doctors for 20 years to check my heart and they give me a cardiogram and say, everything's fine, you know, everything's all right. So I said, I want my heart checked. And he said, you're going to have your heart checked. He said, that's the most important muscle in your body is your heart. And he said, who do you want to go to? And so I told him I had a lot of doctor buddies. And I said, uh, I'll, I'll go see Ray. And so I went to see him and got on a treadmill and about two minutes and he stopped that thing. He said, George, he said, something's wrong, bad wrong with your heart. So you need to, I'm gonna send you straight to a, a heart specialist and you'll save two or three trips going to doctors. And so I went straight to a, a doctor and he put that dye in my, my veins and I had four blockages. It was 100% blocked and two more that was 60 to 70 percent blocked. And he said, you, we, got to, we got to fix that. And uh, so I did a, a quadruple bypass. Uh, I did a quadruple bypass in, in 97. And uh, so the good Lord saved me again. And, and I forgot to say one thing about my colon trouble when they put this bag on my side. I was really sick and uh, I weighed 180 pounds when I went into the hospital, to admitted into the hospital. They weighed me and I weighed 180 pounds. And I stayed in the hospital 14 days and they wouldn't even let me brush my teeth. And I, when I got ready to come home on Christmas Eve, I weighed 139 pounds with two nurses holding me on the scale, so I was pretty low down. But the, but the good Lord turned all that around, and that bag that's on my side is 50 years old, will be 50 years old, December the 11th, so God's still good to me. And this, this, this is something else I wanted to add that, that I don't think I've talked about. When... Uh, my wife and I started talking about getting married. We, the bishop in the Methodist Church in Winston-Salem went sitting there, married us, and we're going through our vows. And 
he said, will you take this woman for better or for worse? And I said, well, I said, let's talk about that a minute. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you said, would I take her for better or for worse? I said, I'm just a poor country boy and some days are good and some days are not so good. I said, how about if I take her for worse till I can do better? And everybody laughed, but her and her daddy, neither one of them laughed at me. So anyhow, about, I don't know, 77 or 78 years old, I was probably 78 years old. I, I got two daughters and a wife and, and I told them, I said, I wanna, I wanna have my funeral and my birthday party all together when I'm 80 years old. And they said, well, I never heard tell of that. And I said, well, that's what I want to do. So I, uh, they planned it. And uh, so when I got 80 years old, we, I invited 500 people to my birthday party. And four, even 400 people came. And we had a, this lady that catered the thing, had a had a tree of cupcakes and it. That thing was six feet tall, I guess. It had 300 cupcakes on that tree all the way around, made like a Christmas tree sort of. And I'd been in the hospital for a week and the doctor told me I, I had colon trouble again. He said, you can't go to your birthday party. I said, well, I think I'm gonna go to my birthday party. And I said, you just, I, I said, I'm going home Saturday night and I'm going to my birthday party on Sunday, and then I'll come back over here Monday and you can start treating me again. So they, uh, we did that and I spent the night at home Saturday night, and then I went and they got me a chair, a high chair, and I sat on that high chair for about five hours and greeted 400 people and didn't get a drop to drink or a bite to eat. And uh, that was a, a good day and a bad day, but we had we had 400 people, and I, I just I love people, and I wouldn't take anything for that. I don't probably not a whole lot of people had more than 400 people at their birthday party, but anyhow, it, it was a it was a bad day, but it was a really good day to have all. Of, and we had people there from five states, and we had congressmen and senators there and just all kind of folks and uh, the state of North Carolina sent me a plaque and a flag congratulating me on being 80 years old so it was a good day. Life, life deals you a lot of blows and some of them are good and some of them are not so good but God has been good to our family for generations and uh, I'll add this one thing and I'm, I'm not bragging but it's might be hereditary. Uh, I, I told somebody not long ago that they said, what have you been doing? I haven't seen you in a couple of years. They said, what have you been doing? I said, well, I said, I'm finishing up a lifetime dream and I don't know when the last day is going to be, but I've been, been blessed. I've been, I've had bumps in the road and been broke down and stuff, but I said, God's been so good to to me and my family for generations, and that's true. My, our family, from the eight, late 1800s, what I know, and my grandmother lived to be a little over 100, and none of our family has ever had any cancer, heart attacks, diabetes, or any kind of deadly disease from that, that far back. And if that's not a gift from God, tell me tell me what he is and uh, so we just we just been blessed and and I'm I'm blessed to have friends here today and uh, I don't know when the end of my life is but God knows and I know where I'm going and before I completely finish I've got two young we've got more than two young friends a stabler who's doing the video and is 17 years old and he's a wonderful young man and then I got Presley and Luke Barker. Presley is a precious young 19 year old boy that's been playing the guitar since he was seven and Luke is 13 and he's he's got the same gift from God that that Presley has and they're gonna 
they're going they're gonna to play uh, here, here in a minute. They're going to play how great they are for us.
Second grade.